Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So we had a great service today for Shabbat. We're really excited. So we've started um, started renting a space from a uh, from a church here in the area, and uh, we've been having great services for the last couple of weeks. Um, we're still working out the kinks, and one of those a lot of those kinks happen because. I forget one thing or I forget another thing, and we're still working out some of the technical aspects. Uh, so uh, the video that we recorded for today's message was a total throwaway. The audio was unusable. And so we're still figuring things out, being in a new space. But um, today, the uh, I continued on in our Sermon on the Mount series, and um, it really it grieved me a little bit that the video was a throwaway because um, this week and then the following couple of weeks um, I really think are important and they're really kind of a uh, almost a kind of a climax in our study so far uh, for the Sermon on the Mount and so I, I wanted to share some points from it so that um, our community online didn't miss out uh, so just to recap, you know, for several weeks, um, our group has been studying the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And the reason why is because Yeshua uh, is a rabbi. He's called a rabbi. He's a, um, he's a, a, a teacher of Torah. And uh, if you're familiar with the rabbi-disciple relationship, it's really a, a master-apprentice relationship. A, a disciple who is fully trained will be like his rabbi, will be like his teacher. And if we, as, as followers of Yeshua, claim to be his disciples and his students, then that means we need to know what he said, and we need to know what he meant when he said it. And the purpose of understanding those things is so that we can emulate him and do the things that he did. Uh, not so that we can just have a bunch of knowledge sitting inside of our heads doing nothing, gathering dust, uh, but so that we can do what he did. So today we focused on Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, which says, this is Yeshua speaking. He says, For I say to you that except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? We've talked about the kingdom of heaven in the past, the kingdom of heaven referring to a lot of what, uh, what Christians in evangelical circles might call the millennial reign. Uh, the kingdom of heaven referring to the days of Messiah in Jewish texts where, where the Messiah will come, or really in our faith he will return. Yeshua will return to the earth. He will uh, restore Jerusalem, restore Israel, restore the temple, and he will rule from Jerusalem. Uh, the restored kingdom of David will rule the earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And that the those who have been faithful to the God of Israel, to his Messiah, they will be raised from the dead to rule with him for a thousand years. And, and you can read about this in Revelation 19 and 20. But Yeshua says that your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees if you want to get there. If you want to be a part of that kingdom, and this is important, we, we better know what it means for righteousness to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. We need, we need to know what the measure is. And in order to really break this verse down and understand it, there's some obvious questions that need to be answered. One is, who are the scribes? Uh, two, who are the Pharisees? What's a Pharisee? And three, what were they lacking? And each of these questions is really a week in and of itself. And I was joking with our congregation today. It's like, listen, I could sit here and do a seminar for three hours and talk about this verse, <laughs> or we can break it up and eat a little bit at a time. So I'll try to keep this video short because this is really week one talking about this verse. Um, but I don't want to leave us all on a cliffhanger either of me spending three weeks talking about historical background and then at the very end tell you what I think about the verse. So I want to summarize up front to tell you what I, what I believe based on the study I've done, uh, what I believe Yeshua is referring to. And then we'll spend, you know, like we spent this week and the next few weeks digging further into this verse, into the context. So um, I, I've heard 
different interpretations for this verse, and I'm sure anybody who's listening has. Um, I've heard everything from how maybe the Pharisees believed in works-based salvation, and, and that's what Yeshua is talking about is, you know, your righteousness has to be better than that, or um, how the Pharisees maybe uh, focus too much on tradition and, and really should focus on the written Torah instead of so much tradition, or how the Pharisees' righteousness didn't really come from their hearts, you know, um, I've heard different opinions. Um, but I truly believe, based on the study I've done, that in Yeshua's statement here, Yeshua, first of all, is critiquing a particular group of scribes and Pharisees. Um, this is not necessarily a blanket statement that's being made against this whole group of scribes and Pharisees. This is against a particular group. And we'll talk about you know, what group uh, over coming weeks, but Yeshua's critiquing a particular group of scribes and Pharisees. And if there's one word that could be used to describe scribes and Pharisees uh, that they share in common, it's meticulous. Uh, scribes are meticulous about the written text of the Torah, and they're meticulous about the details of legal texts and legal documents. Um, and you know, the Pharisees, the party of Phar the Pharisees in the Second Temple period were meticulous about, uh, about oral tradition that had been passed on from generations prior. Uh, meticulous and very particular to the details of tithing, of ritual purity, um, and all of these things that the scribes and Pharisees were meticulous about. These were good things. There's nothing wrong with being meticulous about these things. And I told our group this morning that if the scribes had not been meticulous about the written text, imagine, you know, we live in a time of luxury where you can have a Bible in your hand, but, you know, part of the reason we have that Bible today is because the scribes were so attentive to the details of the text. Um, and so it was a good thing for the scribes and the Pharisees to be meticulous and attentive to the details of their faith, right, of uh, things that pertain to their faith. But I truly believe that what the master's critiquing them on is what they were not meticulous about, is what they were um, not attentive to, and specifically having to do with the commandment in the Torah, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is where I believe Yeshua is critiquing the scribes and the Pharisees to say that they were falling short and that if we want to have a share in the coming kingdom with Yeshua, we had better make sure, I believe this is Yeshua's point that he's getting across, we had better make sure that we are just as attentive to loving our neighbor as ourself, that we are just as attentive to honoring God in our personal relationships with people and in fulfilling the spirit of the Torah, that is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that we should be as meticulous in those things as the scribes and the Pharisees were meticulous in every other aspect of, of Judaism, of their faith, of Torah. Um, so I believe that's really the crux of what Yeshua is getting across to his disciples. And I believe that th that idea is really the springboard into what Yeshua is going to continue to talk about in Matthew 5. He continues on, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you have heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, uh, you shouldn't even hate your brother in your heart. And see how he's, the subject of what he's dealing with in Matthew 5 is a person's relationship with other people and how a person walks out. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I think um, based on the context and the historical, the culture of the time, there was a big focus a meticulous attention to things like ritual purity, things are, that are important, that are important, but that in all of that there was a lack of attention to love, to love. And, and what is the focus of the Yeshua movement from the very beginning? What does Yeshua tell his disciples? This is how they will know that you are my disciples, by the love you have for one another. You know, Paul's famous chapter in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, if, if I do all of these wonderful things and, and don't have love, I have nothing, all right? And, uh, and in the letter, of, I believe it's in 1 John, I, you know, I don't have it in front of me, but you will know the passage 
where he talks about how can we love God who we have not seen if we can't really love people who we have seen. And so this was the focus for the Master Yeshua, is getting, getting the minds of the people and his students back um, to the essence of the Torah, which is loving your neighbor as yourself. That really and truly, you cannot love God without loving your neighbor and serving your neighbor and being careful towards your neighbor. And so that, that's important. And it's so important that Yeshua says that is a key. If you want to, uh, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, uh, you'd better be showing love to your neighbor. Uh, you'd better be honoring the Torah when it comes to loving your neighbor. So that's the summary. Of, of what I think this verse is getting across. But now I want to spend just a few minutes. I don't want to keep this video too long, but uh, I spent a few minutes to answer some of these questions that I felt needed to be answered for the historical backdrop of Yeshua's statement. The first question that I want to deal with, um, and just for this video, is who are the scribes? Who are the scribes? He says, your righteousness has to exceed the scribes. What's a scribe? So, Think with me about a historical timeline for a minute. Um, if you're familiar with when the, the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon, okay, the, the, the kingdom of Judah, Judea, was exiled to Babylon, right, for a period of time. Uh, remember, the prophet Jeremiah says 70, 70 years, right, your people are going to be exiled, okay. Before that exile, and then during that exile, um, the Bible describes a scribe. It talks about scribes. And during that time, in those days, a scribe was really a copyist for a king. It was an official position in a royal government. Um, and you can check out um, like verses like 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. And um, it's describing when David took his position as king of Israel. And it lists some of the people in his government and it lists uh, certain leaders of the people, and it says, you know, Sadok and uh, the Sadok and Ahimelech were the priests in that day. Uh, it says that Joab was over the army, and then it says a man named Serayah was the scribe. So it was an official position where they, the the king would give a decree, the scribe would write it down, and it would be distributed among the people. You can read in Esther chapter three about the scribes for the king of Persia who uh, write down the wicked Haman's decrees and they pass it out to all the provinces of Persia. So the scribe is an official position. Okay? It, it's not until after the Jewish people returned from exile in Babylon and uh, they returned back to the land of Israel, began rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple. It's at that point in time that you're introduced in the text to the Torah scribe and the very, the, the very first and the most famous of them is Ezra. Ezra the priest, Ezra the scribe. So uh, Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 says, Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe or proficient scribe in the Torah of Moses. And then in Nehemiah chapter 8, you can read, um, I'm going to read just a selection briefly. But Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, and then verses 7 and 8. It says, Ezra the priest brought the Torah before the assembly, uh, both men and women, all who could hear with understanding. And he read the Torah before them. It says, uh, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women. It says, the ears of all the people were attentive to the Torah, the scroll of the Torah. And Yeshua and Bani and Sherevyah, a list of priests, and the Levites, it says they caused the people to understand the Torah. And they read in the book the Torah of God distinctly, and they gave the sense. They gave the understanding. So you can see here, Ezra the scribe and the priests and the Levites, their role as scribes were to be faithful to the text of the Torah, to read the Torah, to write the Torah, and also to interpret the Torah for the people, to cause them to understand how to carry it out. And this role of the Torah scribe continued on through the Second Temple period. And the, the scribes that you read about in the Gospels are kind of carrying on this tradition of Ezra the scribe of maintaining the text of the Torah, writing it, 
reading it to the people and also uh, maintaining the traditional interpretations of how the Torah is walked out. And so um, the scribes served as guardians of Torah interpretations that had been passed down from one generation to another. Very quickly, I'll read to you a, a section from what's called the Mishnah, and it's, uh, it's kind of the foundational work of Jewish oral tradition, oral law. Um, but here's a section that describes in, in Mishnah Peah. Um, it says that there was a rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, who, uh, and he, was, he came to discuss with Rabbi Gamliel a, a legal dispute, a question of how the Torah should be carried out. And how they were going to resolve their dispute was they went up to the temple, it says to the chamber of hewn stone, and they asked about the Torah. And there was a scribe there named Nahum, Nahum. And he told them, he says, well, here's how we resolve it. He says, I have a tradition from Rabbi Miyasha, who received it from Abba, who received it from the pairs of sages, and they received it from the prophets. It's a, it's a, it's a law, it's an interpretation of Moses from Sinai, that the law should be this and this and this. I don't want to get too much in the details of what, de what they were actually discussing, but to get across the point that in the days of Yeshua, in the days of the Second Temple period, when there was a matter of dispute, they went to go see the scribe. And the scribe would resolve the dispute by quoting, by citing the sources of legal tradition that had been passed down from generations to generations. And so the scribe was all about citing your sources, right? And there's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to know where things come from, right? So scribes in the Second Temple period didn't just copy the Torah or biblical texts, but they were also responsible for writing uh, marriage decrees, uh, uh, excuse me, marriage contracts and divorce decrees, legal texts. And you can think about when you sit in, you know, you sit in front of a, an attorney and they're uh, writing out a will for you, a last will and testament, or some other legal document, it has a fixed text. It's very important. All the words are put there for a specific reason, a very detailed, and this is the same thing. Uh, you know, so, so scribes were meticulous in matters of Torah and matters of law, matters of Jewish law, um, and specifically regarding the texts. Um, uh, continuing on, the, how, so what, what is a scribe in Hebrew? How do you, what do you call a scribe in Hebrew? Uh, you call them a sofer, a sofer. And it's very interesting. Sofer is based on a verb that has nothing to do with writing so much, uh, and not as much to do with writing as it does with counting. That a sofer is one who counts. And what would that refer to? Uh, that, well, that refers to the act of counting the letters of the Torah. And what that is, is it was a method for maintaining the accuracy of the text was by counting the number of letters and say, a column or you know a particular section you knew you were on the right track and so you can just imagine the level of attention to detail in the text to be able to count the letters of the Torah and know know that uh, it's appropriate to know that it's accurate so finishing up uh, the New Testament records many interactions between Yeshua and the scribes um, there are scribes who are rebuked by Yeshua, and then there are scribes who are held in a good light in the text of the Gospels. Um, there is the wise scribe in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, and he was the one who came to Yeshua and said, what is the great commandment in the Torah? What's the greatest commandment? Of course, Yeshua answers him and says, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this scribe is, is referred to by Yeshua as being not far from the kingdom of heaven. But then there are also the pretentious, self-serving scribes who are described in also in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Yeshua says there are these self-serving scribes who like to walk in long robes, uh, to get greetings in the marketplaces, to get the best seats in the synagogues, the best places at the feasts, and those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense or for a show make long prayers. And so again, you know, this is this is our master's constant refrain to kind of a kind of a sense of religiosity in his day. 
that it's not so much the things that the scribes and the Pharisees were meticulous about. It's not necessarily those things he was upset with. It's the things that they were lacking that, that were not the focus. And these things had to do with how you treat people, how you treat the vulnerable in society, how you um, elevate yourself over people um, for a show or, or to get power over people. Um, that is, that's not an attitude that's befitting for the kingdom of heaven. So the last thing I want to mention today, and I, um, we'll cut it off for this week, is um, I want to skip ahead. I want to give a spoiler alert um, and look for just a moment at Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. So this is the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, after Yeshua is done uh, giving his message to the people. And it says, when Yeshua had finished saying these things, the multitudes were astonished at his teaching because he taught them with authority, not like the scribes. And what I shared with our group today was, notice here in this passage that the people were not necessarily astonished or taken aback at what Yeshua was teaching. They were not necessarily astonished at his content, but they were astonished at how he taught, at the the authority with which he taught, that it was not like the scribes. What does that mean? Well, think back to the example I just gave a moment ago from the Mishnah, that the scribe who was consulted about a matter of Torah, what does he do? He cites his sources. Well, I received a tradition from him, who received a tradition from him, who received it from him, and so on. And that is how the scribes would teach. That was their job as the maintainers of the traditional interpretations of the text. And think, con contrast that with how Yeshua teaches in Matthew 5. You've heard it said by the scribes, right? By the teachers of the people. You've heard it said, but I say to you, Yeshua was teaching the people not so much like a scribe, but like a prophet. And that's very important. And I, uh, you know, I give the example of, imagine, you know, think about Elijah. You know, on Mount Carmel, facing off with the prophets of Baal, Baal, and telling the people, how long will you limp between two opinions? And he's speaking to the people with authority. And the prophets of God spoke to the people of Israel with authority. And the people, the Jewish people in Yeshua's day had not really experienced this type of prophetic, authoritative teaching since really the days of Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi, who are considered to be kind of the close of the prophetic period in Jewish history. And this was, a period, this was right around 400 years before Yeshua was walking the earth. So the people had not seen something like this. Had, they'd not heard teaching like this in quite a long time. And then all of a sudden, here's John the Baptist, Yohanan, the immerser, on the scene, speaking and calling the people to repent, to return to the Torah, re return to true faith and loving each other, and, uh, and speaking with authority. And they, they, the people perceive and be a prophet. And then, if you thought John the Baptist was something, listen to this teacher, Yeshua who is coming to teaching, he's not only teaching with authority, but he's backing up what he says with acts of power, acts of gilrah, acts of uh, miracles. You know, So a, a true prophet is finally among the people. After so long, they've been waiting to see something like this. Uh, the prophet Malachi you know, prophesied at the what's considered to be the close of the prophetic period in Judaism, in, in a sense. But he told them in the last chapter, of Malachi says that I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the day of the Lord, right? The, the great and terrible day of the Lord. And so, you know, in this time of Yeshua's day in the first century and then all of this messianic fervor, all of a sudden the people are seeing prophets among them again. And they know that's, that something's happening. Something's happening. So Yeshua was teaching the people not like a scribe, but like a prophet, speaking with true authority and backing up his authority uh, that was God-given, backing it up with acts of power. So um, if, for those who take the time to watch this, I truly appreciate you, and I was doing this for you. I just really felt that um, I wanted to take some time and uh, recap what we talked about today so that you wouldn't miss out 
um, because it was really my fault in, in trying to get the video worked out today and it just didn't work out. But you know what? We're works in progress. And and uh, i just so thankful. Thankful to God for what he's doing. Thankful to live in such a time as this. Uh, to be able to serve the Master Yeshua and to uh, prayerfully continue on the path of discipleship with him and to teach other people. Teach other people about him as well. So I will... Leave it at that. Shabbat Shalom. Be blessed this week. There's a lot of important things coming up. Just briefly, we're in the three weeks right now. This is the time of the three weeks, a time of a time period in Judaism where our thoughts, the thoughts of the Jewish people are directed towards remembering the destruction of the temples that took place and longing for the future. Not so much crying for the past, but longing for the future redemption that will come with the Messiah. And we long for him. Though he tarries, I will wait for him every day. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. So as, uh, as Revelation ends, even so come, Lord Yeshua. We welcome you. We long for you. We, we're going to mourn with the Jewish people during this time and comfort them and, and, and uh, stand with them. And we're going to long for the coming redemption. May it, so. May it be so. May it come speedily in our days. So, shalom. and Have a great week.